Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing opioid receptors. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing the different families of G-protein coupled receptors. Now, we've gone through three of the five families of G-protein coupled receptors. We've gone through the rhodopsin family, which is the main family. We've gone through the secretin family, and we've gone through the glutamate family. We're now going to look at the adhesion family of G-protein coupled receptors and also the frizzled slash taste 2 receptors. Okay, so next up is the adhesion family of G-protein coupled receptors. And basically, this family of G-protein coupled receptors is special because the ligand for this uh, for the receptors within this family of G-protein coupled receptors is not your conventional idea of a ligand where it's some free molecule. Instead, it's components of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so if I draw the plasma membrane in here, then you have a large amino terminal domain here, uh, which is going to interact with um, the extracellular matrix. And then you have the seven membrane spanning alpha helices here, and then the carboxylic acid group inside. Okay, so here's the amino terminus. And basically, this large uh, amino terminal domain here uh, will interact with components of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so I'll color this in in blue here. So this is some component of the extracellular matrix. Okay. So I'll put ECM, which is short for extracellular and then matrix. Okay, so all members of the adhesion family of G-protein coupled receptors have large amino terminal domains so that they can interact with components of the extracellular matrix. Okay, and the final family of G-protein coupled receptors is the frizzled forward slash taste 2 receptors. Okay, so frizzled slash taste 2 family of G-protein coupled receptors. And basically, uh, this family has the stupidest name. And the reason is that it's named after its two uh, main members, basically, which are the frizzled receptor and the taste 2 receptor. So again, it has a rather large amino terminal domain. And basically, it binds its ligand on the amino terminal domain. Okay, but it doesn't have the special feature that um, the glutamate family G protein couple of receptors have, or the special feature that the secretin family G protein couple of receptors have. So in this case, it can't be categorized into any of these other ones. Okay, so you can't categorize it into the rhodopsin family of G protein couple of receptors because the ligand is bound by the amino terminal domain. You can't categorize it into this family because it isn't sort of lodged in between the amino terminal domain and the seven transmembrane portion. You can't categorize it into this glutamate receptor family uh, because it doesn't have the venous flytrap domain. Okay, so this is kind of what's left, basically. Uh, those G-protein coupled receptors which bind their ligand in the uh, amino terminal domain but then don't have any other interesting features. Okay, so the two main members of this um, family are the frizzled receptor and the taste 2 receptor. Now, the ligand for the frizzled receptor is Wnt, okay, and the frizzled receptor then triggers the activation of the Wnt beta catenin pathway. And the taste 2 receptor, its ligand is bitter tasting molecules, basically, and it's involved in the gustatory system. Okay, so that's a um, brief whirlwind tour of the different families of G-protein coupled receptors. Now, it's the rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors that we are interested in for opioid receptors, okay? So all of the four opioid receptors are within the rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors, which means that uh, they, um, they, are, they bind their ligand within the transmembrane domain portion. Okay, so... Uh, basically, there are four members, okay, so four uh, opioid receptors, ORs for short, 
Okay, so what now are the four different types of opioid receptor? Well, basically, there is the mu opioid receptor, which I'll abbreviate to mu o r. So this here, this is the Greek symbol mu. Okay, and then it's the mu opioid receptor. So o r is short for opioid receptor. Okay, so the O is opioid, and then the R is receptor. Okay, uh, then uh, you have the kappa opioid receptor. So kappa is another Greek letter, and then we'll have opioid receptor. So this is, it looks like a K, but it's a kappa. Okay, so kappa is usually written smaller than K, basically. Uh, then you also have the delta opioid receptor. So delta has this sort of curvy portion here. So this is delta. And then finally, there is one that doesn't really fit in with these ones. And this is the opioid receptor-like one. Okay, and for short, the opioid receptor-like one is abbreviated to ORL1. Okay, so this stands for opioid, that's the O, uh, receptor, that's the R, and then the L is for like, and then we have 1, so the opioid receptor like 1, or O-R-L-1, or 1. Right. Okay, so these are the four different opioid receptors. Now, they are all rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors. So when the ligand binds to these receptors, they then change conformation, so I'll draw this. Okay, so here is the cell membrane. Then we have within the cell membrane our seven membrane spanning alpha helices. And then we have our carboxylic acid tail here. And all rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors have very small amino terminal domains. So I'll draw the amino terminal domain here very small. Okay, and basically what will happen is the ligand will bind here. So let's show the ligand binding. Okay, so I'll show this as this little turquoise blob here. And basically, when the ligand binds, it will cause a conformational change in the G-protein coupled receptor. And specifically, you'll get a conformational change in the three intracellular loops. And when those intracellular loops change in conformation, they will make available uh, a, a binding site for a heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so let's now talk about heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, right. So, uh, heterotrimeric G proteins consist of three subunits. Okay, we'll start with the uh, arguably the main one, although as we'll see for opioid receptor activity, the other two are actually more important. Well, in some ways, more important. Okay. So, the main one is usually considered to be the alpha subunit, okay? So, I'll draw the alpha subunit here in red, okay? And basically, the alpha subunit has two states. It can be in the on state, and it can be in the off state. Now, in the on state, it has guanosine triphosphate, GTP molecules bound to it. And in the off state, it has guanosine diphosphate, GDP molecules bound to it. Okay, so let's say at the moment our alpha subunit is in the off state. So it has a GDP, guanosine diphosphate molecule bound to it. Okay, so this is a guanosine diphosphate molecule. Okay, now, uh, the alpha subunit of heterotrimet G proteins also has a lipid modification, basically. It has a lipid group attached onto it, which is what I've uh, represented by this little line here. Okay, so basically, um, alpha subunits of heterotrimet G proteins can have either meristic acid molecules stuck onto them, which is a 14 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. So it's what should officially be called um, tetradecanoic acid. Okay, so tetra for four, um, decanoic to turn it into 14, and then fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, so meristic or tetradecanoic acid is a 14 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. Uh, there is also palmitic acid, uh, which is a 16 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. And the real name for this is hexadecanoic acid. 
okay, or the chemist's name for it is hexadecanoic acid. And basically, alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins can have both uh, meristic acid molecules and palmitic acid molecules stuck onto them. Some of them actually get both of them, okay? Uh, most of them get at least one, okay? So most of them have one, some of them have two. The point is that absolutely every single one of these alpha subunits gets at least one of these long-chain carboxylic acid groups stuck off the side of it. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, basically, the long-chain carboxylic acid group will anchor into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, okay? So, uh, this long-chain carboxylic acid here will implant into this inner leaflet, and then that holds the entire alpha subunit just underneath the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, basically. And that's what holds the alpha subunit to the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's how the alpha subunit remains attached to the inner leaf that of the phospholipid by there. Okay, and then um, this is the alpha subunit. In heterotrimeric G proteins, you also have two other subunits. Now, the other two subunits always remain bound together. Okay, so the other two subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins are you have a beta subunit and then also a gamma subunit. Okay, so let's show the beta subunit here in blue, and let's show the gamma subunit here in green. Okay, and basically, um, the gamma subunit also has a lipid modification added onto it. Now, this is not quite as simple a molecule as meristic and palmitic acid, okay? Um, it instead gets a type of lipid modification called a prenal group added onto it, okay? Now, prenal groups have a more complicated structure than meristic and palmitic acid. They are polymers or oligomers of isoprene. Okay, now if you know what that means, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. If you want to find out more about it, I have an entire playlist on lipid modifications of proteins. I'm not going to explain it here because it takes me quite a while to explain uh, prenylation of proteins. But the important thing to understand is that the gamma uh, subunit has this lipid molecule, this very hydrophobic group sticking off the side of it, and this will implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there and hold the gamma subunit to the inner leaf that of the phospholipid by there. And basically, the gamma subunit also brings the beta subunit, so it has the beta subunit with it. So, overall, the beta and the gamma subunit, since they always remain together, people often refer, this, for, refer to this as the beta gamma complex. And overall, the beta gamma complex is going to remain at the inner leaf that of the phospholipid by there. Now, basically, when the alpha subunit is off and has GDP bound to it, it can associate with a beta-gamma uh, complex, basically. So at the moment, they will be associated together, bound nicely together. When the alpha subunit has GTP bound to it, however, it doesn't associate with the beta-gamma complex, and instead both of them will be off and doing their own thing. Okay, so at present we have our heterotrimeric G protein here, and I'll just write that out. Uh, the reason it's called a heterotrimeric G protein is because each of these uh, three subunits is different. That's the hetero. Trimeric means we've got three subunits, and then G protein refers to the fact that these are, uh, well, the alpha subunit is certainly a G protein because it's got uh, guanosine uh, nucleosides. Uh, bound to it. Oh, sorry, nucleotides, rather. Guanosine nucleotides bound to it. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, what we now want to discuss is the range of different alpha, beta, and gamma subunits there are, and which heterotrimeric G proteins the mu opioid, well, the, all four of the opioid receptors uh, work through. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.